today we'll probably wrap up that chapter on sound. We're going to look at the ear and hearing aids and stuff like that. So we'll probably wrap up that chapter. We might even move on into the chapter on light. I just want to show you a few things. Um, first of all, if you're on the website, you go to the concept test website. Uh, you can download those sound questions that we've been asking in class. And if you want to print these out next time, you probably know the answers. You have them in your notes or whatever. But if next time when you come to class, I'll show you what the answers are because they're not on this sheet. So if you want to print them out and then bring them next time, I'll go through and just show you the answers real quickly um, in class. And then I've also gone ahead and uploaded the questions in a similar way for the next chapter. So if you want to print those out so you'll have them, that's fine. Otherwise, they'll be there. Um, and then I've also put up, or this has been up, but I just want to show you guys, there is a, I, sorry, I don't even want to call it a project because it's not that big of a deal. It's only like a thousand word paper, but you know what? Like you can write your name in a thousand words. A thousand words is pretty short. Uh, so I guess if you had a thousand word name, that would be a pretty long name. But anyway, it's not a real long paper is what I'm saying. And you can also do, a, or you can do a presentation. If you'd rather do a presentation, I don't usually get many students do presentations because I don't know. Y'all just don't like public speaking or whatever. And that's fine. The paper and the presentation should take about the same amount of work. And they'll be graded in much the same way. But what you're going to do is you'll need to pick some topic that we've discussed and then just explore it in greater depth. So I don't know. You might think about something to do with Newton's laws. Like, uh, we talked about the high jump, so you might want to talk go into the physics of the high jump or something along those lines. Some topic that is related to what we've what we've discussed this semester, okay? And then you'll take that to greater depth. You can use your book as a reference, but I also want you to have. Gosh, do I give you guys two additional resources that don't include your textbook? All right. Do you just want to warn you that if you plagiarize this in any way, I don't know. I don't know. I, mean, I can usually tell just from looking at them, but uh, if you do plagiarize it, you'll get a zero, and that's very bad because it's a pretty big project for your grade. It's 150 points, which is, I think I say it here, 18, almost 20% of your grade. So really what I intend this to be is, one, kind of a fun thing to take something that you found interesting and then just take it a little bit farther, further. And also, if you don't do very well in exams, and some of you all just don't do well in exams, this is really an opportunity to help your grade, to improve your grade from this, okay? It, it counts a lot. If you meet the criteria, you'll get a good grade. And I give you the criteria in this rubric. So for example, in A paper, you need to explain at least three concepts in physics. It needs to be well thought out, yada, yada, yada. You can go through and look at that and, and just make sure that you're meeting the criteria. And in fact, if you want to turn it into me, say a week in advance, I'll take a look at it, and I'll say, yeah, this is an A paper, or you need to work on this just a little bit more. So I really want this to be an opportunity for you to get a really great grade on it, and I'll help you how I can, uh, and to help your grade in the class. That's really my intention for this. But also a place for you to just take it a little bit farther and learn about something that, that you might not have known about, or maybe something that you do know a lot about, and uh, applying the principles of physics that we've discussed. Okay. So don't feel like it's a burden. It's really meant to help you. Does it feel like a burden? No, it's not really that bad. It's not that long of a paper. The presentation won't be that bad. Um, but don't plagiarize it. You'll, up, you'll upload it on Moodle. Turn it in. Always catches those things anyway. So don't even try. It's not really worth it. What does it do? Oh, you never use Turn it in? Oh, when is it due? Oh, uh, let's see. I think I say on that rubric, but it's due at the end of the semester. Uh, let's look at the calendar. So we have an exam on the 10th. Uh, we will have presentations either on the 28th or the 3rd. I'll, I'll ask you later who's going to do presentations. So in the meantime, be thinking about if you want to do a presentation or not. And depending on how many students are doing presentations, then We'll, uh, we'll either have them on the 28th or the 3rd. We're going to go over to the rec center, too, so on one of those days. I just need to figure out how many students are going to get presentations. If there's just a few of you, we might just do the presentations over at the rec center. But the papers will be due on the same day, either the 28th or the 3rd. Okay? I'm a little bit flexible on that. We'll see once we get to that. 
Any other questions? Yeah. All right. I just want to sort of throw it out there so you can be thinking about it. You might already have a topic in your mind. And so you might just, over the next week, just think about, what is my topic going to be? What do I find interesting? What do I already know a lot about? Okay? Y'all can do that? Awesome. Okay. Um, let's see. Last time we left off with the Bernoulli principle and how the Bernoulli principle works with your vocal cords. Remember, you, you force uh, your, how does it work? Your, your vocal cords are pulled apart by the muscles, and then you force air between the vocal cords. And because you have that high-velocity air, you get a low pressure. Remember Bernoulli's principle says, if my, if my fluid has a high velocity, I have a low pressure. They're inversely proportional. And because I get this low pressure, the vocal cords come back together. And then you have that process as the vocal cords vibrate, coming together, going apart, coming together, going apart. And that's what actually physically creates the sound the interplay between the muscles and the, the Bernoulli effect, this low pressure in between the vocal cords. We're now going to move on to uh, hearing. And, you know, the basic principle of hearing is that we're detecting vibrations. So we're going to look at the anatomy and physiology of hearing. You know, look at the, hear, the uh, ear in anatomy. Yeah, okay, well, you've probably seen a lot of this then. You'll need to know the basic parts of the ear and what they do, probably even in less detail than what you learned in anatomy. Um, so the basic principle is that we just detect vibrations. Our ear is used to detect vibrations. And it has three parts. Okay, you have the, uh, the external part. This is the outer ear. Uh, let's see, I don't have this right now. It's called the oracle, right? Oracle? That's A-U-R-I-C-L-E. It's that sort of funny shaped part on the outside of your ear. We'll talk about this later, but it's actually designed in such a way to pick up the frequencies that we speak at. So the shape of the ear is not just random. It, it actually is optimized in order to pick up frequencies at which people speak. Because we speak in a fairly limited frequency range. Uh, and that outer part of the ear is there to sort of capture those particular waves. The second part is the middle ear. This takes us from the, the oracle down to where the uh, eardrum is. This is also called the tympanic cavity. I'll write this down in just a second, but uh, it basically acts to amplify the sound. So we'll write that on the board. But your tympanic cavity, think of like a timpani, right? You know what a timpani is? The big drum. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, a timpani. Uh, your tympanic cavity amplifies the sound as it travels down this one inch or so to your eardrum. And then finally, the third part is the internal or inner ear. And it's everything to the left of the eardrum, or to the right of the eardrum. Uh, and we'll talk about what those are. That's where you have the, the three little bones that take the vibrations of the eardrum and transfer it into the cochlea. And then the cochlea, which takes those vibrations and transfers those in an, into an electrical signal that goes to your brain. And we'll look at how that works. All right, so sort of summarize what I said here and write it down. The outer ear is the oracle or the pinna. You need to know the basic uses or the basic purposes of these things. Uh, and the auditory canal. Is that right? That's part of the outer ear? The auditory canal? It is. Okay. I had that written down. I wasn't sure. Um, the oracle is just a visible part of the ear. And it just directs sound waves to the ear. And as I 
I said it's optimized for speaking frequencies. The frequencies at which we speak is optimized to pick up those particular sounds, but it can pick up other sounds as well. You can think of it as a funnel for waves. It helps to funnel those waves into your, into your ear. The uh, ear canal Yeah, so I guess I was mistaken. The ear canal is actually part of the outer ear. Did I say differently from that before? Anyway, the ear canal or the auditory canal is part of the uh, outer ear. So this is all outer ear. It's about one inch long. It is open at the oracle, of course. and it acts to amplify sound. You should also know that this is called the tympanic cavity as well. That's the part of the ear that you're not supposed to stick anything into, right? Like they sell you those little uh, Q-tips or whatever, but you're never supposed to stick anything smaller than what into your ear. Nothing smaller than your elbow. I can't even get my elbow into my ear. But you're never supposed to stick anything smaller than your elbow into your ear. That's what they say, like ear doctors. What's that? They they made Q-tips for babies back in the <laughs> back in the like 18 or 1900s, and uh, they it was just supposed to be like to put medicine on their on their bottoms or something. I don't know, but. Then people quickly started using them to clean their ears for whatever reason, because it feels good, I guess. But you're not supposed to, like your doctors say, don't do that. It's very, very bad for your ears. Auditory canal. Right, yeah. Let me, uh, hold on, hold on. Okay, yes, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. So the auditory canal, I'm not sure about this. Do y'all know the tympanic cavity? I have it in my notes as being part of the middle ear. I'll check on that, Mariah. It is part of the middle ear. That's right, your speech, right, speech? Uh, it is part of the middle ear? Okay, yeah, so the tympanic cavity, I misspoke, I'm sorry. The tympanic cavity is part of the middle ear. And it's different from the auditory canal. Am I right about that, JC? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sort of going by your book. I'm learning this as I go along. But everybody clear on that? So I misspoke. The auditory canal and the tympanic cavity are different. The auditory canal goes from your oracle down to your eardrum. And that's called the auditory canal or the ear canal. And the tympanic cavity is, is it the beginning of your eardrum? Or is it just... Okay, I'll look into that and see what it is, like why it's called the cavity. Or is it just like the eardrum? That's what you were thinking, that it's just the... Okay, so it's like a big timpani. Okay. All right, sorry about that. I'll look into it. Let me make myself a note so I don't forget. All right, thank you, JC. All right, so the ear canal... It's also called uh, the auditory canal. Uh, and then we come to the middle ear, or the, uh, yeah, the middle ear. Uh, we have the eardrum. And this is also called the tympanic cavity. We have the eardrum, and then we have the three bones, and these are called the auditory ossicles. I'll show you a picture of these in a few minutes. Um, the middle ear also has an opening called the uh, an opening to the pharynx called the eustachian tube.
is just an opening to the larynx. So you have this uh, from the middle ear, you have this tube that goes from here down to your larynx, which is where your voice box is. And that's why, like, if you, if you do this, you can feel pressure build up inside of your ears because you force air up into the back side of that, uh, back side of your eardrum. Um, and this is also, this is to help drain, this is why kids sometimes get ear infections because when they get all snotty and stuff and that eustachian tube gets clogged up, they get fluid built up behind their ears and then that becomes infected for it because they get bacteria there. All right, so the eustachian tube connects this to your larynx. And this is to equalize pressure with the atmosphere. It would be very bad if we had a closed system inside of our ear because if it was always at the same pressure, then your eardrum would bulge out or in depending upon where you were. So you remember that video with the, the water bottle? It went down to deep to a, like 30 or 40 feet and it just sucked in. It would be a similar thing with our eardrum. If we went to low pressures or rather to high pressures, then it would push in on our eardrum. And if we went to lower pressures, our eardrums would bulge out. But because we have this eustachian tube, it helps to equalize the pressure behind our eardrum with the atmospheric pressure so that it doesn't bulge in or out. So that's the purpose of the eustachian tube is just to equalize that pressure. But of course, we get problems when that tube gets clogged up for whatever reason. Um, the eardrum is also called the tympanic membrane. And it vibrates the eardrum vibrates when sound impinges upon it. So remember we talked about how microphones work? This works exactly like a microphone. We have some uh, flexible surface, right, our eardrum. And then when we have sound waves that come onto it, it causes this flexible surface to vibrate back and forth, back and forth. So when a, a peak of my wave comes here, it pushes it in. When a trough reaches the eardrum, it pushes it out. So my, my eardrum will vibrate depending upon the frequency of my sound waves. It works exactly like a microphone. The only difference, of course, is that a microphone transfers that vibration into an electrical signal. Uh, and the ear eventually does that, but it just happens a little bit differently. Can I go down from here, y'all? All right. So the auditory ossicles are three small bones. I think they're the smallest bones in the body. Am I right about that? Yeah. Okay, so the auditory ossicles are just three small bones. Uh, one is called the malleus. You do need to know what the purpose of each of these is, sort of what they're called and what they look like. The malleus, it, it looks like a hammer. This handle is connected to the eardrum. The incus looks like an anvil. I'll show you a video on how these work. You can see them. And then the third one is called the stapes. Looks like a stirrup. Like you might have on a saddle of a horse. Um, the ossicles will transfer The ossicles transfer vibrations. 
So them working together in concert, they transfer vibrations from the eardrum to the oval window of the inner ear. Uh, let me go ahead and show you a video, and then we'll finish up with these, the sort of the different three parts of the, the middle and the inner ear. But let me go ahead and show you a video, because they show pretty well how these vibrations are taken from the, uh, the auditory ossicles to the ear, or from the eardrum to the auditory ossicles and then to the inner ear. Adele? I'm, I'm going to look into that. I think that it's, oh, you're... The inner. Okay. Okay. Did you hear what she said? It's from the eardrum to, from the eardrum to the. Okay. Y'all hear that? The tympanic cavity is that space between the eardrum and the eustachian tube. Okay. For the sake of this, just know that that's where the eardrum is. It's the the place where the eardrum is. Asia. Let's go and watch this little video. It talks about the ear and how it works. But then it also uh, it goes into the inner ear, which we'll get to in just a second. But let me go ahead and show it to you now so you sort of have some context where these things come into play. All right, so a um, couple things I want to point out there. And he mentioned this in the video. But we do get a, an amplification of sorts of the actual pressure. And this goes back, you can sort of think of it in terms of Pascal's principle, though that doesn't exactly hold. Remember Pascal's principle from the previous chapter, where if we have a, um, a piston, he talked about this as pneumatic amplification, and if I apply a certain change in pressure here, then I feel that change in pressure all over, and that this is our idea behind uh, hydraulic lifts where if I apply a force here over a small area, then over here where I have a bigger area, I get a bigger force. The same thing happens. It's a slightly different meaning because we're not talking about fluids. Instead, we're talking about how we, have, we go from the eardrum to the, uh, to the ossicles and then further to, that, uh, to the cochlea. That, that force, in a very similar way, is small at the eardrum and then a lot bigger at the, uh, at the cochlea. So we take those tiny little vibrations on the eardrum and amplify that force for the cochlea. All right. Um, so the pressure of these vibrations is amplified by about a factor of 20. Another way that you might think about this, and it's probably a more correct way to think about it, is of a lever. Remember we talked about a lever where if I have a board and then I have an off-centered uh, moment or an off-centered axis of rotation, if I apply a small force here, I get a big force here. So you can think about that how, to, that how you like. Actually, the lever is probably a more correct way of thinking about it. but. The point is that in the end, you get an amplification of that vibration. So a tiny little vibration becomes a measurable force on the cochlea. Then we come to our middle, our inner ear. And the inner ear has three parts. We talk about these in your book. You need to be familiar with them, be able to identify them. Uh, the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals. Mainly, we're going to be concerned with the cochlea. The cochlea he talked about, it's this fluid-filled chamber. If I have a change in pressure on the cochlea, because the ossicles will press onto the ochlea, if I have a change in pressure at that point, that change in pressure will be transmitted all throughout the cochlea, 
again, thinking back to Pascal's principle, if I have a change in pressure in a fluid, I'll feel that change in pressure everywhere. So it is a fluid field, fluid filled chamber that has pressure waves. for different pitch sounds. All right, so a higher pitch, I have a higher frequency of the pressure wave. A lower pitch, I have a lower frequency. And that's dependent upon how that ossicle is transmitting the, uh, is everything okay? Is everything okay? What's wrong with the weather? Oh, really? Oh, okay. I guess the rivers haven't crested yet, have they? Or they're about to crest. Is that right? Yeah, everybody's floating. All right. Okay, so the cochlea, you have these pressure waves inside the cochlea. They talked about that. Uh, at different frequencies, different parts of the those hair cells will resonate, as I talked about in that video. But anyway, the point is you have these pressure waves that travel through the cochlea. Uh, this causes the bacillar, bacillar membrane. Am I saying that correctly? How do you say that? You might know. JC, do you know? Basilar? Okay, the basilar membrane to vibrate in different ways, depending on the frequency. And then fibers in this membrane. Uh, stimulate the hair cells. Which are connected, these hair cells are connected to the to the auditory nerve of the brain. And the auditory nerve goes straight to the brain. So you have these bones. They transfer vibrations from the eardrum to the cochlea, the co or uh, yeah, to the cochlea. Then you have the fluid inside the cochlea, which feels those same pressure vibrations. So you get these pressure waves that travel through the cochlea. They interact with the basilar membrane, which causes, depending on the frequency, they'll interact with it. And then they'll cause particular hair cells. Different ha hair cells will be uh, sensitive to different frequencies. So if you damage those hair cells in your ears, that's how people can be not able to pick up particular frequencies because they damage particular hair cells in their ears. Uh, and then those stimulate the hair cells, which send an electrical signal to the brain, which is then you know, transmitted as sound to the brain. Okay. Uh, the vestibule. You just need to know that this helps maintain balance. And the semicircular canal similarly help maintain balance. So both of these are the other two parts of the inner ear. I don't know fully how they work. Uh, as I understand it, though, there are these fluid-filled chambers. And when your body moves back and forth, those fluid-filled chambers act as a sort of guide to you to tell you where you are in space. Right? That's why if you spin around, you can get really dizzy because you spin that fluid around. And after you stop spinning, that fluid continues to spin inside of you. 
and that's why you feel dizzy because you're not moving but you think you are moving because the fluid inside your ears, inside the vestibule and the semicircular canals are still moving. All right? Have you ever heard of up, down, dizzy? No? Well, as I understand it, and don't write this down because it, it could be wrong, but I saw it on the internet, so I think it's true. Uh, in these, these things that help you maintain balance, you actually have three axes. You have these fluid-filled chambers that go in this direction, in this direction, in this direction. And when you spin in one direction, it causes the fluid in one of them to spin around, and then it keeps spinning, and that's why you feel dizzy. But you can do this thing. I can't do it here because I'd fall flat on the floor. But you can do this thing where you bend over, and then you spin around like this. And it causes a different chamber in your ear to have the fluid rotate, and you, just, you can't maintain balance. It's impossible to maintain balance. I have a little video I'll show you if you want to watch it. It's, don't take down any notes or anything. It's really just for your own interest. But it's kind of fun. Like our kids really like to do up, down, dizzy. But you have to be in the grass somewhere soft. And you have to be really committed to it. You should try it out. It's kind of fun. Maybe afterwards go out in the quad. Um, let me see. I didn't pull it up. Let me see if I can find it right quick on YouTube. Okay. Um, so those are the parts of the ear. Let's look at hearing problems. Your book had quite a bit on hearing problems and the various ways that we can repair them or remedy them. Um, first, you can just have obstruction of the ear canal. Uh, ear. So you can have uh, earwax, too much earwax, which you get from compacting that earwax down with those Q-tips. And so that's the problem with those Q-tips is that you're trying to clean out the earwax, but actually you're compacting it down deeper into your ear. And that can cause pretty major issues for hearing. So you can get earwax compacted down inside of your ear. Um, you can also have swimmer's ear, like you get a lot of water in your ear or whatever. Other, I don't know, other obstructions that you might have. Just physical things that are down inside your ear. You can also have a perforated eardrum. Where it becomes physically torn in some way or punctured in some way. Because usually because you've listened to a sound that's, that's dangerously loud, and that can puncture the eardrum or perforate the eardrum. You can have a middle ear infection. Uh, this causes fluid buildup. behind the eardrum so it can't vibrate properly. We've all experienced this when we have a middle ear infection, or particularly when we have a cold and we're just really congested. We get fluid that builds up behind the eardrum because those eustachian tubes that go down to our larynx, they become clogged, and you just can't drain fluid out of your ear very easily. Kids get this a lot. Why do kids get ear infections a lot? JC, why? Oh, is that? OK. I was going to say because the eustachian tube is smaller than adults. Is that true? Y'all knew this? You knew this? Yeah, they'll put tubes in to drain it off, right? To drain off the fluid that doesn't drain off from the eustachian tube. I didn't know that. Thank you, JC. I always learn something new in this class. It's a lot of fun. All right, so, uh, yeah, so kids get them those eustachian tubes, as she said, are horizontal, so they don't drain properly. Okay, uh, so 
You can also have hearing loss in the cochlea. And most of the hearing loss in the cochlea Uh, is due to loss of hair cells. Hair cells, excuse me. Um, um, this can be caused by loud noises. Uh, age, disease, any number of causes. All right. So when you lose those hair cells, basically you've lost your, you've had hearing loss that's permanent, basically. Um, and then the five, the fifth thing is that you can have hearing loss due to brain problems, issues with the brain. So. Uh, if you get your signal that is sent to the brain, if the brain can't process it properly, then you can have, that can be a source of hearing loss. So lots of different sources of hearing loss. Just be able to identify them and know, you know, basically how they work. It's obstruction of the ear canal, perforated eardrum, uh, middle ear infection causing fluid buildup, the cochlea, loss of those hair cells, and then also brain injuries or brain diseases can cause you to lose your hearing. All right, let's look at intensity of sound. We have some particular relationships regarding the intensity of sound that we'll need to know. Uh, sound carries energy like all waves. Actually, let's, uh, let's see where we are right quick. Give me just a second here. I think I was supposed to do these. I remember where we left off with these questions. We did these, right? About that we did these. Did we do this one about the sonic boom? And this one as well? Yes. This one? No. All right, why don't we pick up here and we'll do a few of these. Was it 17? Bring my thing back. Okay, so which of these is primarily responsible for the, the uh, production of sound? Is it the larynx, the vocal cords, the diaphragm, the trachea, or the thoracic cavity? The one that is physically responsible for actually producing the sound, that actually produces the sound. Which of these is it? I'll stop at uh, 40. Stop at 40. Okay, good. B is right. Vocal cords. Now, all of these things do play some role in making sound, right? Like the larynx. If you remember, it, it's that part that actually contains the vocal cords and helps protect the, the voice box. But the vocal cords are the thing that's actually produced the sound. Those are the vibrating parts that actually produce the sound. The diaphragm, of course, it plays a role because it forces the air past the vocal cords. The trachea is the air actually comes up the trachea to the vocal cords. And the thoracic cavity, uh, I think I just made that up. Is that something? It is something? Okay. What is it? Okay. All right. So I didn't just make that up then. All right. The Bernoulli effect says that high-velocity fluids have a what kind of pressure? Is it low, high, or variable pressure? To have a high-velocity fluid, 
What does that tell me about the pressure of that fluid? All right, I'll stop at 30. Stop at 30. Okay, good. Bernoulli effect just says simply that if the speed if the speed of a fluid goes up, the pressure of a fluid goes down. And we see that in the vocal cords. We spend, send a high velocity fluid between the vocal cords. That causes a low pressure and that causes those vocal cords to come back together. Then the muscles pull them apart, come back together. Muscles pull them apart, come back together. And hence we get sound. They vibrate and make sound. Which of these is not part of the middle ear? All right, I'll stop at 25, 25. Okay, awesome. A is right. The oracle is this outer part, the, the flap on the outer part of your head. Uh, the tympanic membrane, that's just your eardrum. The incus is one of our ossicles, which are those three bones collectively, but the incus is just one of those ossicles. The cochlea does which of these? Helps maintain balance, signals to the brain, amplifies sound, or strikes the eardrum. What does the cochlea do? Stop at 30. I'll go to 32. Okay, awesome. B is right. Be careful on this because the cochlea is part of the inner ear, and the inner ear, different parts of the inner ear also help you to maintain balance, but that's different from the cochlea. Okay, the cochlea is the thing that, it's that fluid-filled chamber that sends an electrical signal to the brain creates a pressure wave inside of it. That pressure wave stimulates those hair cells, which actually will send electrical signals to the brain. Uh, that amplifies the sound. That's going to be our ossicles, going from the eardrum to the cochlea. Those ossicles, like a lever, will generate a higher, a bigger force from the vibrations. And then strikes the eardrum. Uh, it's just the sound waves that strike the eardrum. Which of these may result in hearing loss? I'll stop at uh, 22, 22. Great, B is right. Hey, uh, all of these result in hearing loss, earwax or other obstructions, a middle ear infection, because that eustachian tube will get clogged up and it presses it. If you get fluid built up behind your eardrum, that keeps it from vibrating properly. Uh, loss of hair cells because of loud noises or disease or whatever. Uh, so all of these will result in hearing loss. Hey, um, what word actually becomes shorter if you add two letters to it? And then you say, that's yeah, short. <laughs> short. Okay, we'll come back to this. You get it now? Short becomes shorter when you add two letters to it. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, so let's look at intensity of sound. Pretty simple. Our main takeaway on this is that the intensity of sound 
will decrease as an inverse square law. That means if I move two times as far away, my intensity will decrease by a factor of four. But we'll see some other things as well. So uh, sound carries energy. Like all waves, all waves carry energy. And sound likewise carries energy. Uh, we measure not the energy, however, but the intensity. So we don't measure the energy of a sound wave. Instead, we measure the intensity. So we never talk about the amount of energy that a sound wave has. We talk about the intensity. And the intensity is a slightly different thing. The intensity, which we'll call I, is equal to the power divided by the area. That's going to be P divided by A. Uh, the units of this, what's the unit for power? I don't remember. No, joule is energy. Power, remember, is energy per time. Y'all remember what is the unit for power? That joke never gets old, does it? What is the unit for power? What is the unit for power? It's watts per square meter. Uh, this is a watt. Like a 100 watt bulb. It's an energy per unit time. All right, so the, that is our, our intensity. We're going to have two reference points when we talk about human hearing. Uh, we have the threshold of hearing and the threshold of pain. The threshold of hearing, that is the lowest intensity that you can hear. We'll call this I with a subscript zero. Um, and it's equal to 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. So that is the lowest sound that you can hear, the lowest intensity sound that you can hear of 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. And then we also have the threshold of pain. And that is, we'll call that IP, which is going to be 10 to the, uh, or excuse me, not 10, 1, 1 watt per square meter. All right. Notice that this is dependent upon the area. And so my, if I have a sound, a source of sound that's giving off a certain amount of energy, it depends where I'm standing, because if I'm really far away from it, the amount of area that that sound is covering is going to be smaller than what it was if I was closer. Let me draw a picture, for example. So let's say that I have a source of sound right here. I have a speaker, and it's generating sound waves. And I have people at two locations, here and here. Uh, this sound wave will distribute its energy over a particular area. And so the particular intensity that I receive here is going to be a lot bigger than if it's distributed over a much larger area. So that intensity is going to be not just energy, but energy per time, or watts, power, distributed over a bigger area. And so you see here, when I'm, say, twice as far away as this guy, that it's distributed over a much larger area. So we can write our intensity then, if we assume that it's a point source, if our intensity is power divided by area, then I could write it as this, as a power divided by the area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. And what I want you to take away from that is that as r increases, the radius of our sphere as R increases, the intensity decreases. All right, so say, for example, I, at a, at a distance R equal to, say, I don't know, 3 meters, my intensity is equal to 10. I'll do, uh, let's do an easy number. 
We'll do point. Well, I'll just do one. I'll do one watt per square meter. So at R equal three meters, my uh, intensity is one square meter. What is my intensity at R equal, say, one meter? What is my intensity equal to? Now, I've decreased my distance by a factor of three. So what is my new intensity going to be? It's not going to be three. Yeah, that, I appreciate that. Right? That's what a lot of you are thinking. So I have here the intensity is proportional to one over R squared. So if I increase this value by a factor of three, or actually I've decreased it by a factor of a third, so I have I is my power divided by four pi R squared. My I has decreased by a factor of a third. I have a third squared, so that's going to become a ninth. So I'm going to get nine times the intensity. It's an inverse square relationship. And whatever I do to this side, I'm going to square it, and then I'm going to flip it over here. So for example, if I increase my distance by a factor of three, not a third, if I increase my distance by a factor of three, I'm going to decrease my intensity by a factor of nine. Let me show you. Let me do another example. So let's say that I go from R equal two meters to R equal four meters. I go twice as far away. My intensity is power over four pi R squared. All right, so I've doubled my distance. So what is my intensity? By how much is it going to change? Well, 2 squared is what? It's 4. And it's in the denominator. So am I going to have a 4 or a 1 fourth by the intensity? I'm going to decrease my intensity by the amount squared. It's an inverse square law. An inverse square law. So whatever I do to the distance, I have to square it and then I flip it because it's an inverse square law. You'll probably see a question like that. Just how I change, when I change the distance from a source, how does that affect the, um, you know, the intensity? That's why it's very important when you go to like a rock concert or any kind of music concert is that you're, you're not right up next to the speakers because the intensity up close to the speakers is a lot more than when you're farther away from them. Probably shouldn't go to a rock concert anyway or whatever it is that you go to. Okay. Um, We are going to do sound intensity level. Students often have trouble with this, so I kind of hesitant to go into it. But it's important because we use this a lot to describe sound, sound intensity level. So we have sound intensity, but that's different from our sound intensity level. This is when we talk about decibels instead of watts per square meter. Students find it confusing because of the use of uh, logarithms and you're dealing with factor of 10 changes. All right, so if the intensity of sound is 10 times louder, we only perceive it to be about twice as loud. So if you increase the intensity of a sound by a factor of 10, the person sitting there listening to it would say, yeah, I think that you've doubled the intensity or doubled the volume of that sound. And so because of that, we use a logarithmic scale. Because we're only sensitive to small, or we're only sensitive to very large changes in sound, we use a log logarithmic scale.
You've probably seen logarithms, maybe, maybe not, a logarithmic scale. And a logarithmic scale goes by factors of 10. So if you ever see like a logarithmic scale plotted on a graph, instead of going 0, 1, 2, 3, it would go 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. And so we use this type of scale, a logarithmic scale, to describe sound intensity levels. Uh, this is called, as I said, sound intensity level. Can I go down to the next slide? Let me go to second. Already? Go down. We call this the sound intensity level. As opposed to just sound intensity. And this level, which I'll call L, is equal to 10 times the logarithm, the log of I over I naught. And this is measured in decibels. We usually do abbreviate this as dB. I'm sure you've seen this before in various places, uh, the decibel reading of a sound. Here, I naught, this goes back to our thresholds. Remember we had those reference points? This I naught is the threshold for hearing and it's equal to 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. All right, so you have this equation, uh, but we're not really using the equation. But I do want you to know that, that if I have a change in intensity because of this logarithmic scale, or if I have a change in the level, that it's going to cause a different change in intensity. So for example, if we have um, If we have a change in intensity level, say we have a delta L, which is this value, which is measured in decibels. If we have a delta L, say, of 10 decibels, if I, have a, if I change my, the volume of my sound to increase it by 10 decibels, then it's going to be 10 times as intense. Alright, that would sort of make sense, right? If I change my level of decibels by 10, then it will be 10 times as intense. However, if I change my delta L by 20, if I have a change in L of 20 dB, then this is going to cause a change in the intensity that is 100 times. If I have a delta L of 30 dB, by how much is it going to be more intense? It's going to be what? It's going to be a thousand times more intense. And then likewise, if I have 40 dB, a change in 40 dB, like let's say I go from 10 de decibels to 50 decibels, I'm going to have a change in, ten in intensity. I have a delta L of 40 decibels. My intensity is going to be how much more? 10,000, right. So I think that we could probably just leave it at that. 10,000 times more intense. I just want you to understand this logarithmic nature. And you could have a question like this where, say, for example, you increase the sound level by a fact by say 20 decibels by how much has the intensity increased now your book goes more into detail about the logarithms and how they work but i don't think we're going to get into that here but i just want you to understand that a small change in the intensity level causes a very large change in the actual intensity and that those are different things that intensity level and intensity are different okay is that okay good enough for that Again, there's more details in your book about this and how we use those logarithms. Okay, um, we're also going to skip a couple of things. We're going to skip the section on earplugs.
So if you're following in your book, for the next exam, you will not have earplugs. You'll also not have sound pressure level. You'll have neither of those. Um, and we're also going to skip noise. There were just little sections in your book on each of those. But if you're following along in your book, which you should be, you can just skip the parts on earplugs, sound pressure level, and noise. Um, let's look at hearing aids, though, because those are pretty important. A small section in your book on hearing aids and how they work. Uh, some, am some hearing aids just amplify the sound. So they'll take whatever sound is coming into your ear and they'll amplify it just to give it a larger volume uh, in order to transfer down to your down to your eardrum. Others will actually modulate the frequency. So they'll take the sound and they'll actually change the frequency of the sound. So they'll have a sound coming in and then they'll modulate that frequency in order to make it a frequency that you're more uh, acclimated to hear. So remember, when you lose particular hair cells, you can lose particular sensitivity to frequencies or sensitivity to particular frequencies. So some hearing aids will just amplify the sound. Some will actually modulate the frequency. And then there are some called cochlear implants, which are quite a bit more complicated. And these cochlear implants will... Uh, will send an electrical signal to the brain. I'll show you a video. Often, or not often, but sometimes children are born without the ability to hear because their cochlear, their cochlea is just not functioning properly. And they can put these hearing aids that will connect their, uh, their cochlea directly to their brain and will allow them to hear. So it'll actually send an electrical signal straight to the brain, allowing them to hear. All right, but before we watch that, I just want to touch briefly on ultrasound imaging, and then we'll wrap up with that little video. So we'll come back to that in just a second. The last thing is ultrasound imaging. So many of you will use ultrasound imaging for various things. A couple of things I want you to take away of this. Ultrasound imaging, it uses very high frequency sounds. Like we're talking about 1 to about 20 megahertz. Uh, these very high frequency sounds, you remember, we can hear up to 20,000 hertz. In fact, we found that many of us can't even hear 20,000 hertz. This starts at 1 million hertz. So you're talking about a much higher frequency than anything that we could actually hear. Um, what it does, like let's say that you're looking at a baby. So here's a baby. This is the mother's belly. They put a speaker right here, and it emits these sound waves towards the baby, and then they're reflected back. In a particular way, there's a microphone there as well as a speaker that produces and picks up these ultrasound waves, and then from the way that it detects those waves as they come back to you, it will actually create an image of that child or whatever it is that you want to image, something inside your body. Uh, this can measure real-time motion like babies. Also, you can see blood flow. You can use this to image blood flow are other things that are inside the body that you want to see without, you know, cutting somebody open. You can use it for other things, too. Y'all might have used, y'all use ultrasound imaging for heating tissue and stuff like that for to help people heal. You ever do that, athletic training majors? Yeah, so you can use it to uh, uh, heat the tissue for restorative purposes. You can use it to destroy kidney stones, break them up. Uh, you can also use it for to 
break up cancerous tissue. Um, I want you to know regarding the imaging that the resolution of our imaging is approximately the wavelength of our wave. So if we're looking at what I mean by that, the resolution is the smallest part that you can see. What is the smallest detail that you can see? And that size of that resolution is going to be about the wavelength of the wave. So let's imagine that we have a wave with, say, 3 million hertz. Let's say that our frequency is 3 megahertz, or that's going to be 3 million hertz. Um, the speed of our sound wave in the body is a lot faster than it is in the air. It's about 1,500 meters per second. And so you remember that my speed is equal to my frequency times my wavelength. And so my wavelength, then, is the speed over the frequency. And this speed divided by this frequency gives us about 0 0.0005 meters. Or that's about 0.5 millimeters. Okay, so a millimeter is the distance between the two little tick marks on your 12-inch ruler. Uh, so with a three, me 3 megahertz ultrasound, you can see down to about a half a millimeter, which is pretty darn good resolution, a half a millimeter. Imagine like on a baby inside the mother's belly. All right, let's watch this little video. We'll wrap up.